I feel like the atmosphere is really electric. I mean, listen to it right now, and this is the last day of the show. Well, it's a great chance for us to gather new business and see what's new in the industry. See you at the next IT Expo. We'll be here. Good morning. Uh, before I uh, jump into the, uh, the substance, uh, a, a number of us are probably from out of town, but if anyone's local to, uh, to Broward County, just wanted to give you uh, our thoughts. The events of yesterday hurt us all in the bigger sense of the community, and I know they have particular impacts um, in the community that's actually affected. So best wishes, best thoughts in the recovery here. And I'd like to thank uh, TMC and IT Expo for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, participate in the, the conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about three leading organizations who are using AI and cloud to gain insight and make better decisions and actions. And those actions result in better customer experiences, customer outcomes, operational models, and their business models. I, they can make money doing this as well. And let me introduce our protagonists briefly, and we'll come back to them a bit later in this story. So Kone may be familiar to you all. They're a worldwide provider of elevators and escalators. Block Power is a New York City-based clean tech startup that is providing clean energy efficient buildings in the New York City area. And then Blueprint Genetics is a mid-sized organization uh, that's providing clinicians and patients with faster access to, uh, to gene diagnoses and diagnostic results and individualized treatment uh, therapies. Each of them in their own way is using data to improve the human condition. So that always feels good. And um, we'll come back to them just in a bit. I want to get into a little bit of the, uh, the concepts and then we'll apply those concepts to their stories. So AI, that's kind of a, a big term. It can mean artificial intelligence. Uh, today, it can mean assisted intelligence. At the root of it, it is addressing all types of data, and it's enabling us to understand and reason from that data. It includes elements like machine learning. Uh, Tony, in his earlier uh, pitch, was talking about IoT and sensor data. The world is becoming more connected, right? A few of us were in earlier this morning. How many of us have Alexa or Google Home? Increasingly, uh, the home and the rest of the world are, are connected. It also includes deep learning. So when we talk about mountains or lakes of big data and wanting to do spark analysis or map reduce analysis, uh, deep learning, machine learning are elements of being able to extract value from that data. And it gets a little confusing sometimes because it's, it's really kind of a cousin derivative of analytics. Analytics is very similar. Uh, we like an analytics more towards it's a single query or set of queries where if you want to modify the query, it, it takes relative human intervention to do that. Unlike with uh, cognitive systems and AI systems where the machine and the system itself is helping learn from the data and take action. The other technology piece that's come up in, in both sessions this morning is cloud. And cloud can mean a lot of different things. We're in a multi-cloud world today. Uh, and, and all that really means is that enterprises are using a mixture of on-premises infrastructure applications uh, in a private cloud context along with public cloud services and then connecting the two uh, on discrete workflows to create hybrid architectures, hybrid workloads and services. Multi-cloud becomes really important in being a, an enabler, uh, whether it's on-premises or in the hybrid model or into the public clouds for uh, the data extraction, the data analysis that leads us to AI. We've also, in the prior two presentations, talked a lot about transformation. It was interesting for me because my lens on this a lot is, you know, it's the transformation around data, but, you know, networking, networking is changing, compute is changing, uh, infrastructure in general is changing. And so IDC uh, recently it said, you know, the global 2000, 
all will be impacted in terms of the need for them to do digital transformation, which we hear a lot. It gets tied up into social, mobile, analytics, cloud. But what it really means is a couple of things. They're, they're transforming so they can provide uh, better insights to their customers, real-time insights, better experiences, and then they're faster, flexible, more agile in terms of their own operations and how they bring products and services to market. It also often means for those of us in the infrastructure industry that you know, the roles, you know, we, we typically sell to deputy CIOs and CIOs and various administrators and architects, and now we have these new cloud architects, and we have transformation officers because enterprises are transforming both their applications and their workloads as well as their, uh, the physical systems that underlie their, uh, their operations. And so that's a, that's a big change for all of us in the IT industry. It's also a big change for all of our customers. If you, I mean, whatever vertical or sector you talk to, everybody's being disintermediated by an app. And Joe had it in his presentation. If you look on the right side of the slide, The Economist last year had a really interesting article uh, I thought it was really interesting because, you know, we still fight wars over oil, so it's still, and, and we shouldn't, but it's, uh, it's still really important to the world economy. And their proclamation was data was more important going forward than, than oil. And where it ties back to what Joe was talking about with Uber and Netflix, these disruptors, these companies that have come about, are algorithm-based and data-based. So they're, they're disrupting entire traditional industries because of the data and the way that they can access and use that data. But, you know, there, there's, uh, the, the incumbents among us have many opportunities as well. And as we go through the stories here in a bit, um, I hope some of the takeaways will be examples of how we can all put these technologies and platforms together. So where's the data coming from? You know, it can be, was coming down the 512 yesterday, there's all kinds of monitors, right, you know, looking for the, uh, the toll, you go through the airport, or if you're at the Olympic Games, you're on, you're on video, everybody's got a mobile phone, pervasive connectivity of phones and uploading YouTubes, watching YouTubes. Uh, we're fortunate enough, you know, we get to partner with CERN and do uh, particle uh, acceleration at the uh, Hadron Large Collider and measure that kind of data. That's really interesting and important too. There's banking. So uh, across the board, uh, data is, um, is pervasive. And the networking enhancements that many of the folks in, in this audience have improved over the last 15 years is what's enabled all of the devices to be interconnected, whether they're handhelds or, or sensor-based. Um, you see the data point on the screen, 34 billion connected devices predicted by 2020. That's, that's a lot of devices. I was with a customer yesterday in the insurance industry that their prediction is within seven years. Um, most homes in the U.S. will have 50 connected devices from refrigerators to your CPI or whoever your brand of security provider is. Nest, we talked about Alexa and Google and Yahoo and Apple, et cetera, earlier. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of stuff listening to us and talking to us. And all of that adds up to a lot of data. Uh, the prediction on the data is it's uh, 45 zettabytes by 2020. If my math's right, that's a trillion gigabytes. So a, that's a big, that's a lot of data. Uh, but most of that data is not tagged or useful in a way for traditional analytics systems. So most of it is unstructured. It's not in a tabular format like our traditional databases and the analytics that work on those databases uh, consume. So about only 1% of it has metadata tagging so that you can understand what it is. Of that, about 30% is usable, which equates from IDC's calculations to about only 1% of the data that's out there is actually useful for a traditional analytics system. So uh, the transformation and the victories go to those firms that in the future can take the slivers of information and get the actionable insights from them. And this again is where AI, assisted intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, comes to play as a, uh, as a change or an enhancement to the, the way that we've traditionally done predictive analytics. 
The key to attaining the, uh, the digital experience is also tied up with the way that computing is changing. So our traditional computing systems, they use a programmatic model, set of instructions, uh, rules, data is organized. Uh, where AI can then help with the unstructured data is that it can do the elements that you see on the screen. It can take that unstructured pile from whatever, like we talked about tweets and social media and sensors, et cetera, and it can understand that data, video, sound, put it in context, and then use probabilistic algorithms and heuristics to make determinations about what that data value is and how it could be used. And then, as you see, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the learning piece and the engagement with uh, end users uh, will help us be able to take that information and apply it in a more meaningful way. The, the other part of the computing paradigm is changing from transactions and processes, so more better, more faster, which is part of how we've created these data piles, to taking action and insight. And so in the future, one of the measures of the computing systems that our enterprise customers and customers of all sizes will need is can you retrain your data and can you do that multiple times per day? Does the architecture of the computing system enable it through its software processes and its speed to continually train at the pace that you need to drive the system? And again, in the earlier presentation, we were talking about cloud and cloud adoption and, and this multi-cloud world that we're, we're already in. One of the interesting aspects, you know, I talked about 80% of the data is unstructured and you can really only get it 1% um, of it. Well, the other data point is that 80% of the data is behind corporate firewalls. And that's for a variety of reasons. It could be associated with an application that just you know, it can't either be ported to the cloud or it's critical operational function to an enterprise so that you know, it's not ready to be moved to the cloud. There could be regulatory reasons, uh, et cetera. But 80% of the, the data that exists is behind the corporate firewall. And that becomes important in the role of the on-premises private cloud. And, but nonetheless, you know, if you talk to enterprise, and most enterprises, and we could you know, probably do a, a poll here as well, if you're consuming, say, Office 365 today, well, that's in the cloud, that's in Azure. If you use ServiceNow or Workday or Salesforce or any number of hosted CRM systems, you're using a cloud. And, and that's even before you get into the conversation of am I running my Linux apps in AWS or am I doing analytics in the IBM cloud, et cetera. But the vast majority, the strong majority of enterprises today already are multi-cloud. So the architecture choices that they're making uh, are around that premise. And what we try to do is embrace the fact that they want to be able to ena enable or manage data uh, wherever they want to take it and enable our tools then to support that. And we could all draw, all draw this picture probably uh, differently, but say it's a whiteboard. And uh, I mean, there's lots of different derivatives of this. The, the key point is that these are the, the basic workflows that cloud architects and transformation officers are looking at. So again, there, there's, because of the, the data inertia on premise, there's a tremendous focus on these, with these architects of improving the on-premises private cloud experience to mirror that of the public cloud. And that experience is around the agility through APIs and automation that you'd get from an AWS, an Azure, IBM Cloud, et cetera. The brokered services, uh, the faster time to de deploy infrastructure. And so what, what our, firm, our customers need to look for are the providers that not only can help them modernize the physical infrastructure, but also have the abstraction and API layers that enable them to have the quicker provisioning, the automated orchestration of workloads and applications. And then the next step is, can I take those workloads and applications and extend them to consume cloud services, back to the, the hybrid model, in the different clouds based on the performance characteristics or availability characteristics that 
I want to achieve, and certainly security. Security is pervasive in all this, whether it's at rest, in flight, over the network, uh, with the client access protocols in the clouds themselves. Certainly security is a, a key consideration. The, uh, the other architectural piece that I thought would be relevant you know, to this audience, given some of the, uh, the partners and vendors who are here, increasingly enterprises are using edge data co-location, or what I put on the slide was edge cloud co-location. So this is using uh, co-location facilities that have low latency, high performance interconnects to the points of presence of the cloud providers. Usually they're fairly proximately located. Sometimes they're actually in the same co-location facility or in kind of the neighboring area. This enables firms to, to that point about control to, um, to, to hub the data, control the, the data, and then choose which cloud provider based on their characteristics they want to consume from. The other architectural consideration uh, that we're seeing quite a bit of growth in is secondary data reuse. So many enterprises today will do backup and recovery for backup and recovery. Fine reason. Uh, there are multiple vendors today where through snapshots you can have native copies of data that you can then use for secondary uses like data analytics with a scientist or for DevOps or app dev. Uh, so that's an increasing trend in the industry to don't just ship your data to secondary and tertiary locations, actually make that data useful for you, not only as a recovery point objective, but for the secondary uses. Okay, so back to our uh, protagonist. So again, first with, uh, with Kone, worldwide provider, uh, they move billions of people a day on elevators and escalators. Uh, and they, they're part of the and block power will be similar, this in notion of intelligent buildings. And you may ask, well, why do I need intelligent building? Well, intelligent buildings consume 30% less energy, 10% less water, and employees are 5% more productive based on the air quality in the buildings. You know, and that's data from a variety of different, different sources that show the investments uh, do pan out. So, Kone, uh, and this is a, a great, like with, um, Tony's case, the IoT sensors, they use, a, uh, they use Watson Internet of Things, IoT, as an aggregation platform. It's a hybrid cloud deployment model. Uh, they have a predictive maintenance and quality system that they run with SAP on-premises, and then they get all of the sensor data from the various elevators and escalators. This enables them to do uh, predictive responses based on different heuristics that they've established uh, using the Watson tools. Uh, so that they can support things before they break. Uh, probably more importantly is when their technicians do show up on site, the technician already has all the, the data needed to, uh, to make the repair. And then the, the third prong of the value to them is because it's the sensor data across their 1.1 million estate, they can pull all of that data into Watson, learn from it, and they start making decisions about how to improve their products, both you know, the forward side, as well as train all of their field technicians on common things that they're seeing across the, uh, the world. So a, a, a great example in an industrial sense of being able to leverage data to make better decisions. So Kone was driving the IQ of tall buildings. Block Power is a really innovative startup they're working with 300, have done 300 buildings in the New York City area. Their, their focus is on taking older energy inefficient buildings and rehabbing them with clean energy, solar, et cetera. Uh, a great example um, from their story is they worked with a, hundred, uh, a church in New York City that was spending $120,000 a year on heating and cooling. Um, that's, that's quite a bit of money you know, that was diverted from their mission. To retrofit, uh, it was gonna cost $20,000 up front. And part of the innovation of, of Block Power is they use crowdsourcing and a portfolio plan to, to help uh, their, their customers who can't afford the upfront capital go ahead and make those renovations. So in this case, the church did. Uh, they saved $36,000 a year initially off of that, that, that um, expense and 
it combined with the Block Power Engineering Assessment Tool and their innovative approach on the, uh, the financing side. And that engineering assessment tool is based on the IBM Data Science Experience, which is built on Watson Data Platform. And what Data Science Experience is, is as the name implies, it is a modeling tool where data scientists can bring in and aggregate this historical data. And in the case of Block Power, they built a machine learning algorithm based on energy unit intensity, so EUI. They actually did this leveraging Watson for the entire city of New York City so that they knew the average consumption of buildings. It gave them heuristics that they could, they could then guide. Uh, so they used that machine learning model to determine the factors that were causing energy inefficiency in the various buildings uh, with whom they worked with their clients. The other piece that was clever that they did is they created a mobile platform. So earlier we talked about um, some of the unstructured data being photographs or chatbots. Well, their, their service, or their, their engineering team actually goes around the city and uses a mobile app. They, they take photographs of buildings and then they do interviews and that information all feeds back into the machine learning uh, system. So that's actually how the data is input. So they're using you know, open source Jupyter notebooks and they've got this mobile platform and they integrate the data then into the data science experience and get the models out of it. And then our third company, Improving the Human Condition, um, healthcare. A lot of really big opportunities. Uh, Blueprint Genetics works with uh, 200 hospitals and care providers around the world. Their workflow is basically uh, laboratory results, gene sequencing, data interpretation, and then insight. So that, that's a pretty standard workflow. Uh, they too are in a hybrid cloud model because the gene sequencing has proprietary information both for them and, and their, it's personally identifiable information of the patients. So that's done on premises. And then they leverage Watson uh, Explorer in the IBM cloud, and that is a content analysis system. So you can build machine learning algorithms based off of the content analysis of the, the imagery and from the sequencing, but it also helps with the unstructured data where a lot of what they pull in is medical journal information, uh, just random files, and it enables them to go through and uh, do that process you know, a lot more effectively than they were historically, and it got them down from months to two weeks to be able to do an initial diagnosis uh, for the patients and the care providers. And that then gives them the ability to do tailored uh, intervention and, and treatment for their patients. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, as we've discussed, you know, these are real world examples. AI has progressed from POCs and pilots to we literally have hundreds of firms and in multiple industries doing this to be able to make decisions, take action, and leverage data better to improve customer experiences and their own business models. If you'd like to get more information about some of the, the other verticals or industries, we've got that uh, on IBM.com. And again, thanks to uh, TMC and IT Expo and for you all for uh, participating today.